for Nicola Bennett, colour is like flavour, with art and food being so intricately linked. Originally from the UK, Nicola is an abstract painter whose inspiration sprouts from the ingredients she works with from her home in New Zealand's Bay of Plenty. Sweet, sour, salty, tangy, velvety, crumpled, smooth syrup are all words that constantly remind Nicola of the language of food. Asking what flavour she wants the painting to be, Nicola brings together the full sensory experience of cooking and painting. From collaborating with chefs to create work and hosting intimate art dinners and lunches, where Nicola takes both her food and art to patrons, her work is held in private collections around the world. Nicola is continually surprised and delighted whether she's seeing familiar ingredients such as the humble carrot or taking on the challenge of combining the unexpected such as the fajoa and brussels sprout, where the luscious greens transform into something else. A visual feast for the eyes where the food has disappeared into a sensory experience, it's not surprising that Nicola can refer to one of her pieces as luscious, rich, yet refreshing, zingy and comforting. Nicola loves sharing her joy of cooking and painting, where both passions transform raw materials into something new, resulting in a pleasure that can be shared and enjoyed by others. As her journey gets richer with every cooking experience and brushstroke, the addictive challenge of transformation has Nicola coming back for more. We are thrilled to say hello to Nicola, who joins us from her home in New Zealand today, and you wherever you are. If you are joining us live, please leave a comment and let us know where you are in the world. If you are catching up on a replay, we hope you enjoy the conversation and share it with your friends and creative communities. So let's get started and welcome Nicola Bennett, our 65th Friday feature artist. Oh. Hello! <laughs> Hi, lovely to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Gorgeous words. You're welcome. Well, a lot of them were yours, so that was <laughs> that was half oh. of it. And oh. I was just thinking, like, this is the perfect entree. Like in Sydney, it's just before dinner time. So I don't know, <laughs> having a late evening meal there. So Oh, ho hopefully we'll get everyone feeling hungry. Yes, hopefully we'll be the perfect accompaniment. Oh. So hello to um, everyone who's joining us and welcome. Um, we've got a few people joining us already, so that's fantastic. Oh, yeah, South Africa, La hello. Thank you, Christchurch. Excellent. Lovely. So, yes, welcome to you all. Um, now we've got, as usual, lots to discuss. So yeah. let's get started. I mean, I love that you've been able to combine two of your obvious passions, but let's wind back. So I had this whole vision of you kind of helping out your nana or your mother in the kitchen as a child and all of that sort of thing. But then I was came across the fact that you the first time you cooked for a large group of people, you actually had a bit of snowboarding in mind. So could you tell us about <laughs> that job in France in your early 20s? Yeah, um, well, I was crazy about snowboarding and this job came up where you um, would uh, cook for 15 every night in a snowboarding chalet. And so I really wanted to do it, but I wasn't that a good cook. So I, for the interview, had to cook for four people and chat to them and make it look really easy. So practice and practice it. And then I was there and it was much harder than I thought it was going to be. But um, I, And I actually didn't hardly got any snowboarding in because there was so much cooking. But I, I fell madly in love with cooking. And, you know, the brief was really rich food. So lots of cream, you know, which is typically French, isn't it? Cream and butter. And so mm. I could really go all out. And actually, when I came back, I cooked like that. And my uh, boyfriend who's now my husband said can you start with the cream because um, I'm not sure <laughs> yeah but it, it was it was a great experience and um and then of course when you've done something that's hard like that then everything after that feels um easy yes. yeah yeah no that's but, amazing and yeah. we've got some more people to welcome hi Marilyn uh, I mean, that's about this time zone that um even though it can be a bit tricky we can fit in a few different countries and people at once which is great yeah so oh, um and um so going back to your past did you have like a first go-to cookbook especially when you're embarking on the French thing did you already have a stack of those kind of in your library or no I didn't I actually just took Delia Smith with me 
Uh, so anyone from the UK will be going, oh, my God, Delia Smith, uh, really old fashioned. Um, and I actually just I got in touch with some of the other kind of cooks in the other chalets and said, oh, I need your help. And we kind of got together as girls do, especially for the cake recipes. And um, yeah, that we shared recipes that way. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that's kind of how I did it. But, but, but if I went now, I feel like the cooking would be um, a lot, a lot better because I'm a bit, better <laughs> cook. But yeah, p people did enjoy it. So I, I, I didn't uh, do too basic a stuff. I hope. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they did. And um, when we were talking earlier, and um, so originally you did do a, a degree in art and we were talking about how you did sculpture and printmaking, but then it seemed like doing your master's was kind of um, the turning point where you started to incorporate um, food uh, with the art. So, um, and we were talking about how you did this um, alter ego. Could you explain a bit more about how your master's came about and what you did there? Yeah. Um, so, well, my, my thesis was on the sensory and sensual qualities of the handmade objects. So I made a lot of um, wax um, objects. And so painting actually didn't come till later on. Um, I, I always kind of dabbled a little bit in painting, but um, well, you know, at, at uni I did, did a bit too, but not, not very much. And then um, I was asked to be part of this group show and you had to make um, some work as your alter ego. So you could make up this person and you had to make the work as that person. So I knew exactly who I was going to be. I was this French abstract painter. And when I was painting, I wasn't allowed to have any self-doubt because I was this confident painter. And, and I made th this work and I loved it and it all sold. And then I kind of thought afterwards, well, why don't you just do that until you actually feel like that? And so I would, uh, you know, be this person. And the name's quite funny I, that I made up for myself. It was Fifi Loren, which uh, <laughs> actually I'm sounds really more like a porn star name than a painter <laughs> yeah and yeah. it's like did you have a beret or did you have a chef's hat you know I'm just thinking yeah. like the visuals of how Fifi would look before we even talk about what Fifi made <laughs> yeah maybe I could have bought a bit of Nigella in um <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway that that was life-changing for me that kind of alter ego thing and and it kind of born it was the start of trying to work in a confident way I suppose yeah Mm, yeah, no, that's amazing. And then, mm. I mean, looking at the work there in the slideshow, and we'll look at some of the work in a bit more detail, but it seems that um, senses seem to be something that's so important to you. Although, you know, going back again to the child thing, I also heard you talk about the love of Play-Doh. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so true because it has obviously the, the smell right from the lid, but that texture and um, so... Oh. The, you know, um, was food that always something that was significant and shared in your family or anyway? Yeah, but food was huge because my mom's a fabulous cook and it was her love language, you know, she and the longer that she spent preparing something, the more love there was in that food. And so, yeah, I, I grew up with beautiful food and, you know, knowing that um, something delicious takes time to make, you know, so... And the house always smelt good, you know, with beautiful food. And um, yeah, the, the Play-Doh, um, it's such a sensory, you know, thing. It's got this very particular smell and just, uh, you know, and it feels lovely in your hands as well. Just, and I, I think that's why I love the whole full sensory experience of painting and cooking, because they, they are, they're the two things that fire all your senses up. And that there's so much in common with cooking and painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of people maybe have that fear of cooking. But again, when we were chatting and, and you said, well, it's just following instructions. So <laughs> I'm sure it's a little bit more complicated than that in some. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I suppose it's it's a, it's just a confidence game, too, isn't it? You know, so I just um, I mean, still now I try new things. And that's what actually keeps my cooking love alive is is finding one ingredient and then just trying loads and loads of recipes with that one ingredient uh, that's mm. the hero. Mm. And and I'm mm. always learning, you know, pasta making and and I, I make I have disasters like like anyone else or like in the studio. And it's all learning um, mm. for sure. And I still got lots to learn. And that's what makes it, I suppose, so interesting. Yeah. And I I also love that idea of, um, you know, finding out a, a, the hero ingredient. And I particularly wanted to mention the Fajoa and especially for um, yeah. the non-New Zealand audience. And yeah. I'm just going to show this image because 
I love here how um, you're painting the colour on the fajoa, and I've seen that you do that um, with other uh, food and vegetable as well. But could you yeah. explain um, the fajoa a bit more to the non-New Zealand audience or people not familiar yeah. with it? Well, it's originally from Brazil, actually, um, so I'm not quite sure how it came here, but it's it's been described a little bit like the pineapple guava, but it's a, it's a beautiful floral, tangy, tart, sweet, um, beautiful, beautiful fruit. Um, all Kiwis uh, absolutely love it. And, you know, it's like anything that comes in season for a small time. You're like, oh, my God, quick, the features are in season. <laughs> so yeah, everyone's trying to really make the most of them. Um, and the, the, the Brussels sprout came about because um, I was in contact with a lovely chef in Wellington called Max Gordy. Um, he has a beautiful restaurant um, down in Wellington and he's known for bringing really unusual ingredients together. And there's so many ingredients that we know that go well together, that pair together because they're, we see them in lots of different recipes. But he, he's the absolute king of bringing unusual ingredients together. So I, I was actually collaborating with um, an American artist and I had to work in his way and he had to work in my way. Oh. And he he um, also had food in his practice, but in the title of his work, not so much um, in the actual making of the work, but he, he names his pieces um, food names. And they're always the most unlikely foods that would go together, like ham and watermelon or something you know something um <laughs> that doesn't actually sound that bad now i'm saying it but you know they're, they're really really unusual and so um i had to work with unusual foods and so mm. i contacted my friend max gordon i said can you recommend some really weird foods together and he recommended the brussels sprouts and fijo and sent me a lovely recipe which was like a five spice um wow. type recipe and so i made uh two two large works um on that recommendation and um, is that some of the yeah. studies of that yes yeah, so there's little snippets of those paintings um in there um and i think we've is that the larger yeah, that, that's it that's yeah. it yeah yeah so um some of those lovely kind of golden colors are the brussels sprouts as they're turning um you know, um, not as fresh, but uh, yeah. I, and I actually paint on the ingredient to make sure I have the exact color. So that's what the the kind of color matching is, I suppose, of painting yeah. on it. And I like to have them in the studio and I might have a little nibble and yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to have them in there because then I can, um, you know, really feel that personality of the ingredient, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, that idea of mixing up, you know, the right color, so how important, I mean, did you study the colour theory and do you find that you work straight from a particular tube or do you just do the primary mixing or a bit of both? And how important do you think that knowledge is of colour theory? Oh, um, it's huge and I've learned so much over the years and colour used to quite intimidate me. I didn't think that I was any good at colour mixing and I thought that I had to buy the tube in the exact colour that I wanted because how on earth could I make it? <laughs> And, and now I look back and go, oh, my gosh, you really um, weren't very confident with colour at all. And now I feel um, uh, that I've, I've taught myself, really. I, mean, I have done a, a lovely course um, with the amazing Evan Woodruff on colour, and I learnt a little bit of um, history of colour. And I find all that really fascinating. And, you know, and how colours, you know, um, so attached to emotion and looking at how you know artists through history have used color um, to spark emotions, and I, I do um, know a little bit of that, but actually it's just an intuitive thing. And yeah. now I, I, I see color everywhere, and I'm always spotting color. I'm always on the lookout. Um, it's just a big part of my life. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I say a lot of it is is self taught, but I, I. In, in answer to your question, I love to harmonise my colours. And so I use um, oils with a medium or I use water-based oils. And I um, put them out of my palette and then I mix a little bit of every colour in with those. Um, well, I make a little paste with every colour and then I put that mixture in with all those colours. So they're all harmonised. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that that's key for me. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously the beauty of oil is fantastic with that because um, I'm mainly working in acrylic when I'm painting and even though you've got all the sort of um, go-tos with the um, sponges that are watered down and you've got that, you know, sort of method of trying to keep the palettes moist, it's just not going to cut it as much as the oil. Um, 
yeah oh, oils is so versatile and by adding a medium I can turn it into like like an acrylic if I want to and it can be kind of you know sloshy I suppose like um water or I can make it like a butter you know so it feels beautiful between my mm. fingers and so and it just has this intense richness that um acrylic d didn't have for me yeah I, mm. I and I think that the water-based oil, so there's no smell. So even though, of course, smell's quite important, but you don't necessarily want that toxic solvent oil painting smell. So, Yeah, I don't, I don't use any terps yeah. at all. And um, I love the smell of my paint. And if I don't have that smell, it's like the Play-Doh. It's kind of like, no, oh, it doesn't <laughs> smell that good in here. So I, there's something about the smell of my favourite paint too. It just gets me all sensory, yeah. Uh, yeah. in my happy place yeah and um you know your instagram account has been great going through that and often you do sort of share things and videos and you're talking about all the discoveries and so one of those um you said that you put um gold leaf under the um to mimic yeah. that sort of glow of olive oil and i thought that was super interesting yeah. as well yeah it, i just tried it that time i was kind of you know trying to find a way of making that olive oil translucency and it, and it worked really well in that painting I've, I've only done it in that one painting but I enjoyed yeah. it yeah I'm always trying to play and push and try trying to achieve this um yeah foodie feel I suppose yeah foodie feel. yeah I love that yeah. and so when you're talking about um complementary flavor partners do you automatically know how to translate this to color so like when you're doing fig do you instantly see a complementary palette to the fig um, I, I see lots of colour palettes in my recipes that I go, oh, oh, oh. And then like the fig commission that I'm working on at the moment, I, I found so many recipes that I loved. It'll probably end up being a lay layered of, of different flavours. But um, the last fig uh, recipe that I did, which was a cinnamon pavlova with um, chocolate and this Pauline, it was so perfect. It had the most beautiful colour palettes in. So I probably will end up, the final layer will be those um those flavors in the end yeah yeah mm. so but it the i never the the food is the starting point and what keeps me inspired kind of throughout but often the painting will just go its own way and i just go with it i have no idea what the painting will look like at the end i just know the color palette that i start with and then i just go from there so it's quite intuitive it's a yeah. it's a real feeling and often the color palette can change halfway through if it's not singing I just have to let the painting lead the way really and do you ever feel that you have to sort of rein it back and have a limited palette like where you're just kind of mixing a certain number rather than deliberately disrupting something or you say it's just like an intuitive thing so it's not like I'm only going to use five or six from this range or <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't really work like that. I just kind of, um, you know, let it lead the way. As soon as I start trying to get too thinky thinky and say, well, you've used that colour, you should probably use this colour. The painting's a disaster. I, I, I just have to, you know, look at it, study it. And if it, and if I have the feeling it needs yellow, I just have to act straight away without, you know, going, no, well, you maybe you shouldn't use yellow because, yeah, it's I just, you yeah. just have to, you know, go with it. I think we can um, interfere with a painting that sometimes paints itself. Mm. And so another couple of aspects to um, the mixing of the painting and the food. Um, in 2020, the Forage and Feast, where you and the head chef, Timo, um, set yourself uh, various challenges. Could you tell us yeah. more about that? Yeah, he's a, a great creative chef and he loved the challenge. And so we, we enjoy the kind of build up to the exhibition where we go, oh, should we set each other challenges? What would be really cool? And so uh, one, one of them was a black and white challenge. So I could only paint in black and white. He could only cook in black and white. And he came up with this beautiful um, chia seed cracker with goat's cheese and barbecue blueberries and um, this kind of charcoal ash and it looked absolutely stunning you know and he's that kind of chef that loves to do the fancy um thing and he said I never get to do this because I have to garnish everything and you know so he, he loved that challenge and then one of them was um pink and white and um yeah they were the kind of main challenges and then um a couple of years before that we uh, did a collaboration too and that was um mainly about the, the foraging and so he gave me a set of ingredients that he'd foraged and said, right, you respond to those. So that was the large piece that the restaurant bought. And then these smaller works I had already made and I had ingredients in each painting. 
and then he made a menu to each of those paintings. So the, the collaboration kind of went both ways, which was really interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that just it was fun. Sound amazing. Um, yeah. And I know this wasn't specific to that, but this image here, because I just loved when you were talking about the black. Oh, um, yes. And um, in this one in particular, um, you were talking about your response to black garlic and you said yeah. your burning desire to paint and how you associate flavour with colour. And then you described how the black paint you made had colour and personality because it didn't start as black. You mixed ultramarine uh, blue and poppy red to make the blom warm black. Um, yeah. The garlic didn't start black. Um, yeah, so I, I just loved that. And then you went further to describe the black garlic um, with its soft, tangy, pungent, date-like licorice wonder. I mean, mm, I was yeah. wondering, like, did it take you a long time to build up this kind of food vocabulary or did you always have those words? I think um, because the words are important to me, you know, when I'm working and sketching and they're, they're part of the sensory um, thing for me too, you know, and, and I actually did a little drawing course where I, I responded to um, onomatopoeia words, you know, and, that, and that's Ooh. an easy way to think about how words make us feel. So um, like chop, whiz, you know, there are actually so many cooking words that, that could be onomatopoeia words. And so um, making little drawings from, those sounds really and I think you know words are so loaded aren't they with how they make us feel and and often you know the sound of a recipe can make us want to cook it you know as much as the image and so I think it it's important for me to um have those words in my head and in the studio to to have that kind of um because so they can also be reflected in the work in the richness and how I feel when I approach the painting yeah Mm. You do it so well because it's hard, even without the food, it's always hard to um, come up with another, you know, enough variations of superlatives to describe the artwork itself. So putting that extra level of um, communicating the senses through the painting and the words, I, yes, well done you, I think. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> of your sketches here um, because I was interested in, yeah, like how... <laughs> How do you even start those paintings or respond to the ingredients by, um, yeah, I just thought that the sketches were, were good. So thanks for showing those because oh, that was amazing. That's a pleasure. So that the, the one that you've got there, that's um, the first sketch I did for Spiga restaurant in uh, Auckland. So that is an Italian restaurant. And um, before he was going to send me some a pasta, in, but during lockdown, and it was so tricky to get to me because I live rurally. And he said, um, "Oh, it's too hard to you know to send it uh, you know in refrigerated post." And I said, "Don't worry, just send me the recipe. I'll make the pasta and respond to it." But actually, I didn't need to taste the pasta for the commission because because the name of the restaurant uh, Spiga means ear of the wheat. And, and then he started telling me about his relationship to wheat, you know, as an Italian guy. And, you know, he just, he said when he, when he walks through those wheat fields and brushes his hands along the top of the, of the ear of the wheat, he, you know, feels it's deeply human and instinctual and, and he has a really emotional response to wheat. And I just love hearing people talk about things that they're passionate about. And that was totally enough to set me off on, you know, th there's another drawing, um, from, from that so it's all that kind of abstracted wheat and then yeah. the painting um came from that really easily because um just from listening to this um lovely Italian guy talk about wheat yeah and I kind of I mean they've got also kind of a sort of mid-century retro feel and I love that color palette as well so even if you didn't know you know the origin of the, the sketch I, I mean yeah they're just so interesting in, on their own it's just oh, really thank lovely. you yeah so going back uh, skipping all over the place but you know, yeah it's what, great I love, I love this whole rich orange and green thing and uh, the humble carrot, which, you know, I just yeah. love. I'm sorry about that rude photo. It's actually the only um, picture I had against the painting. But after I posted it, I was like, oh, my God, that's really rude. So I, I needed to point out. Oh. <laughs> Can you see oh, the rude I wasn't, wasn't even thinking that. But um, I would love, to, you know, reading about um, how you referenced um Peter Rabbit's garden and the carrot tops left behind. And now you're doing the collaboration with restaurants, the Sydney restaurant Nell and the yeah. Peter Rabbit garden dessert, which people will have to go on your Instagram to have a look. Can you tell us more about, about oh, that? Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was lovely that um, Nelly Robinson got in touch with me and that he wanted a painting for his restaurant that actually meant something to him and to the guests that he could um, talk to. And so he gave me a lot of freedom and said, you know, can you um, pick something that you like from the menu? And so the, the, this Peter Rabbit's Garden was the one with the most uh, of the story, I suppose, behind it. And he... I knew that that was the one he wanted me to pick too because he is from the place where Beatrix Potter, you know, wrote um, her books. And so I knew that meant something to him too. Um, and it's such a clever dessert. So all these amazing elements to it. There's a um, carrot sorbet, chocolate soil, um, the spiced carrot cake, pi pickled sweet carrots. Um, even the tops of the fronds, the carrots were kind of gingered and glazed and, and it just looked so beautiful that it served up on this beautiful slab of wood and it was an artwork in itself. Um, and it really so, I, yeah, I made every element of the pudding at home so I could, you know, really get to understand the flavour balance and the texture. Because when you talk to chefs about something they make like this, it everything they put on there is there for a reason. So the acidity is balanced with the fat. There's something soft, there's something crunchy. There's, you know, they talk about a mouthfeel. So with every bite, you're experiencing these different flavors and textures and they're meant to make you feel a certain way, the way they're combined. Mm. I mean, I mean, it's fascinating and it's a whole different world, that chef world. You know, just, I don't, I feel I don't really understand it, but I really admire them. I think they're so creative and fascinating to listen to and so um i tried to get that into the um to the piece i wanted it to be refreshing yet zingy rich um yet comforting and so you know i wanted the opposites and the balance the beautiful balance that he had in the pudding in the painting so that was the kind mm -hmm. of the goal and then i wanted to you know bring in the story of peter rabbit and so i thought about the um the narrative and the kind of the words within the story and it's a fun story isn't it it's a it's kind of cheeky, the stealing of the carrots. And so I was playing about with carrots in the studio that had been bitten off. And um, that's what I've, I was kind of showing that you enjoyed. And then I was working with those words, like the onomatopoeia words in my mark making. So hop and hide and uh, crunch. And, you know, those words also that are in the recipe. So I wanted to kind of have all those um I suppose the narrative reflected in the mark making. And so um, I wanted to keep that kind of playful, inquisitive um, nature of the story in the painting. Yeah. Yeah. There's always that lovely sense of movement, whether you imagine the food cooking itself, or in that case, you know, like the rabbit scurrying through the bush or, you know, something. Yeah. But paintings are definitely not static. So there's just no. that, that amazing movement in them and just. Yeah. That, I was going to say a sea of green, but um, it's just, yes, luscious gorgeousness. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of mentioned a bit uh, cooking that to taste it. So I was going to say, like, do you have, do you really, you know, need, you would need to taste all the dishes before painting them? Which then also made me think, do you yourself have to eat something inspirational before you're before you paint and I mean obviously you would like to eat well I guess while you're working <laughs> yeah well lots of the, the food that I paint about is you know from the edible plant world and so that that they're the foods that you know kind of really excite me and um I love to kind of cook with them so they reveal themselves in a more exciting way so the apricot painting that I did in the summer I ordered a box of beautiful Otago apricots to be sent up from the South Island and they were so different from the supermarket apricots. They'd been ripened on the tree. They're from a lovely orchard down there. And they arrived like little gifts. That's it. And they were like little flavor bombs. They were so delicious. And then I had this amazing Ottolinghi recipe of um, roasting them in amaretto. And the whole experience of making the cheesecake was just so amazing. And then, you know, when it finished, I had this, you know, gorgeous slice by myself, just going, wow, how on earth am I going to do a painting that does this justice? Because, and I was, I just loved the whole experience. And I felt like I was having this relationship with the apricots I hadn't had before. Like I was getting to know them in a way that I hadn't known them before. And that's, from from that kind of excited sensory place, I, I'm desperate to paint. You know, I have this like burning desire to um to paint and enter something that's then tangible to 
that can I can always think of well that was the apricot experience I had you know mm. Mm. I've done yeah and then you've got this sort of um you know, I just think it's an amazing uh, business idea, this idea of the art lunch or dinners that you've been doing. And I've got this yeah. um, where you actually take your artwork into the people's houses and also yeah. the food and you're responding to the ingredients. I mean, how long have you been doing that and how, can you tell us more about it? It's amazing. Yeah, oh, thanks. So I, from the restaurant, I kind of went to that because in the restaurant collaborations with chefs, there would be kind of 70 people at an event and it was very hard to get around and talk to everybody and have, you know, a, you know, a kind of intimate conversation about the, about painting or food. And so I had this kind of idea, well, you know, why not take that into people's homes? And so um, that was the first one that, that you posted and it was... Um, somebody that a collector that bought my work before and I when I delivered the painting to a house I was like wow this is a beautiful house and so I just rang her one day and said how do you feel about me turning your house into a gallery for the day and then you are some friends around and we have a nice three-course dinner and she's like yeah that'd be great <laughs> yeah, so, and, like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah no thanks um yeah so that was the first one and it was great and then it's just uh, I've done a few since then and I feel like I've got better and better and so I do a catalog with each one now and the talks um a little bit longer so I talk a lot about the work and my process um and I, I can actually have the time to talk to the paintings which is you know really important um and uh and people can ask me questions and we have this just lovely kind of celebration of color and flavor yeah it works it works really well and and i'm i'm all about the connection with people and that's why the gallery thing doesn't work for me because i really love to you know really connect that's important to me and I, I suppose we can you know you can compare it to if you're a chef in a restaurant and you you're sending out the food and you're not meeting that person that's you know enjoying this thing that you've made you feel a bit disconnected from it and it's yeah. not really satisfying but if you yeah. have someone to dinner in your house and you know, I've made this and you're sitting next to them and they're enjoying it and you, you get so much pleasure from seeing them enjoying it and and mm. th that's where the the real satisfaction lies and so I knew that I had to be the person that um meets the collector or the the s person having dinner with me or yeah so and I love often I, yeah oh, sorry sorry and I was going to say and I love that you've got these smaller ones too which you refer to as the cookbook series um yeah, yeah but, and then they're, they're nice they're in that this is the smallest kind of work I do but they're, they're just they have the feel and the weight of a cookbook so they can be um you know sitting on a shelf like that like cookbooks or just standalone pieces yeah and they're, they're quite different to make because you know you're, you're holding them in your hand and you're turning them um so easily which of course you can't a big painting and so that I feel like they're a little bit more um, intimate and um, different to make, whereas the larger works may be a little bit more gestural and bodily. Yeah. Yeah. We've got some of it. Well, I think that's also just to show the scale, and obviously you're in full flight there describing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and one of those hand talkers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to get a sense of that scale. Um, yeah. So, oh, and I've got another one here of you with that. Um, oh, that's the apricot one that I was telling you about. Oh, yes, yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Um, that's amazing too. Oh, and so when the cookbook ones, um, do, I mean, are you sort of ha making up a, like process diaries and journals or you go as you go, or are the smaller works a way of? Um, uh, documenting and um, you know saving your favorite bits or yeah I'm, I'm not super super organized apart from I um I take a lot of photographs and um, of saved um recipes and colors and so I have loads and loads of cookbooks and you know instead of color photocopying things that inspire me I'll take a little photo or I take a photo of when I've cooked it and so I have literally hundreds and hundreds of photographs of um, food in my studio, a crazy amount of photographs. Yeah, so I refer to those. And that, those are, I suppose, a little bit of an extension of my, um, I suppose, my sketchbook because they're really like little snippets of color palettes or there's snippets of flavors 
or they're almost like um, like a little memory of a time where I've cooked that thing and I can think of the time and the people I ate it with and, you know, almost like a photograph of a place, you know, they take me back to the flavour. And so I that that's generally how I work. Yeah, not I'm not super organised. <laughs> And I was wondering that about places, you know, obviously in the last two years we've all been a bit grounded, um, not necessarily in the way that we'd prefer to be. Um, yeah. But prior to that, did you kind of have food-focused travels or um, do you have like cuisines that are your favourite from overseas or, are you you know, have you got places on your wish list food-wise? Oh, I'd love to do more, more travelling. I, I, I did a lot of Europe in my 20s before I moved to New Zealand um, or I did a, at a time in Italy and I think that, you know, really kind of cemented my love affair with food, you know, seeing how th that culture just so embraces um, eating together and not just for, you know, a quick half an hour dinner, but for two hour periods at lunchtime and for dinner and these long drawn out family times and uh, where food was just the central thing. Um, and I think... Uh, although food's central in our house too we, we certainly don't eat like that um but it was it, yeah I know who would, who would have the time for four, four hours of eating but you know the children that this family I was uh, with in Italy the children would come home from school at lunchtime you know to schools would finish at two o'clock um I think or even earlier and they'd just sit for two hours with their parents eating for, you know talking for two hours yeah amazing and and they were close you know because of that time to be together around food um yeah so um culture wise I, I love to try different kind of cuisines um I've been on a couple of Indian cooking courses which I love because it's, I feel like there's so much to learn there with spices that I don't know yeah. um and then I just um I've got so many different cookbooks Asian um Otto Lingi is my all-time favorite with that Middle Eastern that that's the flavor that I always go back to um I, that's my ultimate favorite and i and got that also because of the sort of um, vegetarian aspect or just all the flavors as well i think he just really understands flavor so incredibly i i've got all his cookbooks and um i they're, I, they're definitely my go-to and they're kind of a no fail aren't they i don't think i've had any duds of his um mm. And I love all those flavors, yeah. But I'm I'm always keen to try something different, and and ho hopefully um, we're traveling again one day. Um, yeah, but it's a good way to bring another country into your home, isn't it? You know those flavors, and mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I don't have that strong um, connection to certain flavors like people do from you know other cultures. Um, like e England doesn't have an amazing kind of. <laughs> <laughs> food culture and dare I say nor does New Zealand um we, we've got incredible ingredients and we've got amazing chefs but you know we're not a country that's known for x y and z you know it, what, what people think of pies don't they when they think of New Zealand cuisine um and so um, I think you know, <laughs> yes a bit of homemade chutneys and things yeah. things that can put in jars and preserves yeah <laughs> that's right but you, you know you can make your own food memories can't you and we, we've um we have kind of taco friday and dumpling monday and i'm ever on this quest to uh find a better and better dumpling ingredient mm -hmm. um yeah and then we just um you know i'm, I'm just learning all the time and, that, and that's what makes cooking i suppose so exciting and so fun yeah with that, that just made me think like with the edible plant um kingdom that you mentioned before so when you're doing art lunches a day or dinners they are all vegetarian based in the menus yeah yeah i don't advertise them as that they just know they're gonna eat something delicious and then um i, I don't even mention that and everybody yeah. has a lovely lunch or dinner and yeah it's all that matters you know and i've spent days cooking um generally um and and i've taste tested everything and practiced the recipes and yeah, I know it's delicious and I, I hope that, well, like the feedback I have is um, everyone's absolutely loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of a um, needs must eating person when it comes to food. And I was just thinking the only similarity I can think of there is in terms of art and food for me is that preparation where you constantly know I've got this thing happening over here and that thing over yeah. there and I'm kind of like bringing it all up and hoping and then kind of you know you're putting the finishing touches on the end before it sort of goes out but but that's as far as my personal experience of it would go I think <laughs> yeah it is a timing thing and you 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 know there are only obviously 
certain things that you could do at, at a lunch or dinner like that that you can prepare in advance and then just uh, that will go together really easily on the day like there's no way I'm frying something before I'm serving something up or they're all re designed and so they can just be you know reheated or assembled um with loads and loads of prep time yeah yeah amazing yeah and, you know, that where do you draw the line with the whole, I mean, have you growing your own produce as well? Like, are we completing the circle here? <laughs> oh, I'd love to say I'm a great uh, vegetable grower, but I'm not. I'm really lazy. And um, I only have what's in the garden. So I've got oranges and figs um, and some yeah. herbs. Yeah, but that that's about it um and so but I, i'm i've got a an amazing organic grower down the road and so i get a big box of organic veggies delivered every week and you know even if i was a, had my own vegetable garden it would it would only be maybe a few things and this this organic veggie box comes with all kinds of beautiful things even aubergines and like Chinese cabbage and chilies and I mean sprouts. I love sprouts. It's it's so I actually don't need to. I, I, but one one day I'll not be lazy and um, get into gardening. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about, um, you know, that I'm always sort of looking for the potential in something. And um, so sometimes when you go to the, um, uh, you know, grocery or supermarket and you come across these, you know, to the uh, white Australian eye or my, my eye, um, you know, this unidentified fruit thing. And I'm yeah. just seeing it as a sculptural object. Um, but, yeah, like, are there any foods that you avoid? I don't think there would be, would there, other than meat? <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. And I, I love le learning about new um, vegetables. So I, I got really into oyster mushrooms uh, last year, um, the pink and the grey. And they're so beautiful to grow. You know, you can get these um, little kits. Have you done it? Yeah, like little plastic. Um, In Sydney at the moment, there is so much mould. There's just fungi sprouting up everywhere. So... <laughs> Oh. They're telling people to watch out with the mushroom kits because, um, oh, yeah. you know, random things are just sprouting up everywhere and people can't be sure whether it was the kit that they used or not. So, um, oh, really? Yes. I hadn't heard about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, I didn't have anything strange like that. But, um, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're beautiful. So that, that I suppose that I could add that to the list of the things that I grow <laughs> on my one hand mushrooms <laughs> not many but yeah i i love to kind of get very excited about one ingredient and then really uh, take it to this kind of hero status and um and get just have this kind of love affair with this one ingredient for a month or more while i'm painting it yeah so when you're in the studio and um perhaps not so much working on a particular ingredient that you might have in front of you do you kind of have like a little go-to that you whip up because i bet you don't do beans on toast <laughs> oh, yeah. no well I'm absolutely crazy about avocados and so my my all-time quick um thing to eat would be avocado on toast so not very glamorous but always delicious I I yeah I, can ne I would never ever get sick um of avocado are, are you an avocado lover yeah and then there's moments where um you know there's just frustrating or and avocado management you know where you just there's no ripe ones in the supermarket so you kind of have to have them in different stages and then you've turned your back and suddenly they've gone and then they just have to go in the dye bucket and you have to use them for eco dye instead or something <laughs> <laughs> if you're amazing like you yeah got, there's, there's a company um over here called uh, the avo tree and they send you um tw 12 avocados like every week or something like that and they're all perfectly designed and so they um you know ripe at different times and then you um can enjoy a perfect and each one is always perfect there's never any marks or yeah i know it's avocado yeah. heaven so yeah. to be honest i don't really have the uh, trouble at the supermarket and then are you sort of adding a fancy virgin olive oil or anything or just straight avocado mash? Oh, i do love i do love a good olive oil and mm. um, there's a village press and salt and pepper to keep it pretty simple unless yeah. there's good tomatoes in season and then i might mm. um, do <laughs> stuff but otherwise avocado on toast are always a winner yes Oh, and so the other thing I was going to ask about colour, you know how there's always that classic interpretation of colour, you know, red, anger, green with envy. I mean, yeah. would you like to rewrite those or what does red say to you? Oh, I don't use much red to me. I've just uh, used a little bit of red recently with figs, but it's a 
it's such an intense color. I, I, it's just a little bit too much for me. And especially if it's with yellow, it kind of hurts my eyes. I've got, I feel like I'm quite sensitive to certain color combinations, but I, I suppose I, I go back to my, um, I suppose favorites, I suppose of, you know, greens, I'm always trying to learn different ways of using greens. And, you know, when you look in nature, there's no two greens together that could ever clash, you know? So, I used to think like a viridian green and a sap green together w wouldn't go, but it, you know, of course in nature, n there's, there's no such thing as two greens that don't go. And so then it's just a matter of trying to make them balance within the thing that I'm kind of creating. But um, yeah, and, and warm colors like orange, of course, but I, I don't use um, very much blue and a tiny bit now and again, because there aren't of course many blue foods. Um, but I don't understand how green is linked to envy and jealousy, you know, as a thing. No. How, how is that? I mean, and then you kind of think, yes, but it's nature and it's lush and it's growth. So it seems like all those old tropes that we're told don't even make sense anyway because there's always an undoing of the, of the yeah. same. Yeah. Well, we've yeah. all got our own relationships to food, to colour, right? You know, and I think, you know, if, if you if you look now with things that are sold, that a lot of the time they're, they're almost um, – food names you know like you might see bed linen that's called lavender or honey or because they know we have this kind of emotional response to the color with the word you know and so I think that almost mm. those colors are being rewritten anyway with how lots of things are kind of marketed to us um, emotionally and yeah I, I hadn't actually um, thought about green with jealousy and envy for a little while because of course green for a lot of us is just uh, as you say nature and um <laughs> Yeah, that uh, yeah, for, and well, for me, it's obviously so many foods that I eat are green, and so I'm always looking at green. And where I live, you know, in Akiri Falls, is just surrounded by green bush, and the lake is a little bit greeny. Um, and so I'm just looking at green all day, so it makes yeah. sense that it would be, and, and I wear a lot of green too. Um, it, it makes sense that it would be my work, yeah. Mm. And I love that idea of um, noticing the difference in the greens. And when you said sap green, I was thinking, yes, I've got that. And then I start thinking how green gold, like golden open, make a green gold and it's series seven and it's really expensive, but you can't actually make it through combining um, blue and yellow. It only has to exist like that, but it's still worth yeah. just having that own tube on its own because it's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same. I was driving through... Um, out to the desert last week and uh while I wasn't driving or even when I was because the road was very long you know I'm seeing the little bushes and I'm thinking so that's a bit of sap green and if I mix that with a bit of lemon yellow and then a tiny bit of white I'd oh. get that and then in the sky there's a little bit of raw umber and if I mix that with a bit of ultramarine blue and then I'm thinking well, you know I need to pull over and I need to but it was a very long road I was not pulling over <laughs> so, so you're thinking about color a lot too all the time <laughs> yeah. yes so I mean uh -huh. Obviously, you've been doing your art catalogues, but are you going? Do you see any uh, cookbook in the horizon in the mix there at all? I, I would love to, yeah, one day, and, I, and I'd also like to um, take it into film. Is that they're my 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 two kind of goals? That maybe a little bit dreamy and and big, but you know, you got to dream, haven't you? Get a dream big, yeah. Dream big. And yeah. Um, Maria also says, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah, green gets a bad rap generally, and uh, as Lisa says, it's not a cooking show. But she wants to know how <laughs> you have Avo smash. I guess you just smash with ketchup, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, there there is the, you know the fancy uh, guacamole, of course, with um, garlic and lime, and yeah, I'm a bit of a lover of that. But when you're in a rush, just avocado on toast is good. Good solution. Yeah. <laughs> And I was going to ask you if you had, I mean, I know we had a little couple of technical hitches before we started, but I wondered if you had a favourite um, kitchen gadget or an art oh, gadget. But yes, I, I bought two along and um, not very novel, but the, this, the whole, um, you know, the, if you got one of these, the, those beautiful, um, this one's actually from the UK, so it's my um, favourite, I've had it that long and, and it slightly matches my top. Yeah. Um, but they they're amazing, aren't they? For for scraping um, the last bit of something from the cake bowl, um, and actually my, my favourite art tool is similar, but it's missing its handle because it's so well used. Um, it, it's a colour shaper, and it's exactly the same thing. It's silicon, 
and it just glides over the oil so beautifully and makes these gorgeous translucent layers. And so I thought it was quite funny that my two favorite things, I didn't actually realize till you asked me what my two favorite tools were, but actually very similar, silicon. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> And like they always say, you know, that thing of, because as artists, I guess you're always trying to raid the kitchen looking for other implements that you can mark, make with or take with always that caveat of um, now once it's been to the studio, it's not allowed to go back to the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Covered in paint. And, yeah, I have tried that with whisks and, you know, trying to take weird things from the kitchen in. But I'm, I'm quite attached to my brushes. So, um, yeah. Uh, I I haven't haven't had much success with taking weird kitchen implements into the studio. <laughs> yes. Mm. And what about that idea of um, I guess the corresponding of um, color to taste or um, like a taste test? Yeah. You know. I know. It's fascinating that have you heard about the restaurant in the UK where you eat uh, in pitch black? Have you heard oh, about this? No, no. Do tell. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I'd love to go. So you're served by blind wait, waitresses, that um, which is amazing. And then you, you can't see a single thing, not even the hand in front of your face. And so someone that had been was telling me that they actually could not work out what they were eating. And I was like, well, you couldn't really recognise the flavours and the texture. And she's like, no, just could not work it out. And so that's fascinating, isn't it? You know, that you, you that without the colour that you can't, experience the flavor or can't recognize the flavor but then yeah. you know the sort of not that it's a competition but do you get to the end and they give you a like is there some sort of a thing at the end where they're like okay you scored 10 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i know you'd, you'd want to know that you'd go you know compared to other people did you kind of work it out or with the yeah i, I think it's fascinating and then i listen to an amazing podcast um, from a, like a neuroscientist that studies flavor and she uh, gave the you know the analogy of her husband was really keen on coffee and so he it, they had this brand and he wanted this organic brand which was more and so she said okay look I'll make you a brew up and I'll blind test you and we can we can see which is the better one and so you know she, making a way and he was like I'm so going to know what the organic expensive one was and so mm. she made him two cups of the cheap coffee and so gave, which he, he'd had for, you know, months and months and gave him the first sip. And he was like, yep, yeah, that's one we always have. It's really average. It's bitter. And then, she, and then she said, okay, and here's the other one. And he was like, oh, uh, that, that one is amazing. You can tell it's organic. It's absolutely delicious. And she said, they're both exactly the same. And he was like, what? And so we, we, we get so emotionally attached to what we want it to be. You know, we, we like portray the story across and that can affect the, the taste so much that we can ima imagine an amazing taste that's not there. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just thinking back to the whole dark thing. I mean, even just finding your own mouth and just not being able to cut up the right size portion. And then what about that whole thing of like, um, you know how people like to sort of eat a little bit of everything on their fork at the same time or now there's all this other research about you have to eat things in certain order because from a digestion point of view that's going to make <laughs> it talk about well, overthinking it all overwhelming yeah well I'd love to experience something like that it would be incredible yeah I think yeah. you should totally go I know you need to do yeah. it like um go fund me because oh, yeah. so... <laughs> yeah. let's sponsor Nicola to go and eat in the dark yeah. <laughs> nail the test Oh, you're so funny. Yeah, I'll give I'll send my score. So Tanya, thanks you for your insight and inspiration. Oh, a pleasure. Thank you. That's so kind. And, and we've got oh yeah, people with their kitchen tools. Yeah, for jelly plates. Yeah, well, there yeah. you go. <laughs> I stood in the kitchen for five. I mean, Lisa stood there working out how she could get a mark. I stood there for five minutes working out what I was going to eat. And I was oh. thinking of you and I was thinking, I can't do beans on toast. What else can I do? I need more <laughs> oh, yes, lovely. Kitchen whisk. That's, that's yeah. I, I should try that. Yeah. And the old try. steel wall too. Yeah. Yes. I it's actually, I, I don't really like anything that has a horrible um, sound or feeling. So I can't do any sanding or anything like that because I can't stand the sound or the oh. feel of it and so all my processes I love to be soft and gentle and you know mm, just it has to all be the lush and smooth and the spirit yeah 
Yeah. No, no, he can't be doing with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's been amazing. It's been so good. We're nearly oh. at the end and um, just, I mean, yes, just it's just been fabulous and delicious. Oh. And, um, well, you're a great yeah. interviewer. Thank you for the lovely questions. <laughs> Thank you. And, do you have a favourite food or season? Are you sort of excited when there, you know, is about to be a new season around the corner? Yeah, well, that's what's so lovely, isn't it, about food? You, you know, you make the most of this thing while it's in season and then and then it's gone and then you have to wait till next year. But I wonder if we got to have them all year like that, whether we'd enjoy them as much. And, and I think maybe we enjoy them that much more because it's just for a short period. So the, yeah. the next thing in season um, that I'll be looking forward to probably is asparagus, which will be spring. Um, but that's terrible. I'm missing all the winter vegetables, aren't I? Um, no, I do I do love um, everything that kind of does it come into season. I make the most of it. Well, I hope I do. And then, you know, with the cauliflower and all those amazing kind of mm. root vegetables I'll be getting kind of stuck into. But the next... Um, big work I've got is finishing is the is a fig work a beautiful fig work and the figs in my um, garden have just finished um but I managed to make this um beautiful Otto Lange dessert before they disappeared so I need to get painting when I've got all that sensory pleasure all stored up yeah yeah I always think it's funny that you mentioned figs because for a really limited time in March as they start to come in it's always that exciting thing to, that, that that's the only one that really comes to mind <laughs> But yeah. then when you said that with asparagus, that made me laugh because my husband um, lived in New Zealand for years and he always talked okay. about the asparagus slap slap. And I was like, what is that? Oh. And they had these, um, I don't know what they call them, but um, kind of like sandwich shops where the oh. food is displayed in like a perspex sort of, um, uh, you know, little window thing. And so yeah. you open the perspex um, door and yeah. then like the sandwich but I think there were like <laughs> little um asparagus sticks rolled in white bread and that was just oh. a thing and when our kids were little we did a bit of a road trip in New Zealand and I remember yeah. you know hunting these places down and found one or two <laughs> where sure enough you would open up <laughs> a little thing of asparagus wrapped up in I've never experienced the plastic oh, uh, door you bring it back it? yeah you do yeah <laughs> Asparagus in white bread rolled up is a classic, as long as it's not tinned asparagus. It'll kill me slowly. Classic. Oh, my gosh. Rhubarb, yes. Oh, I do yeah, love rhubarb, rhubarb is amazing. Porridge, amazing. Yes, yes. Oh, we should have started with this at the beginning. Now people are coming up. I know. Yeah, <laughs> cherries at Christmas. Yeah, especially in the South Island. Oh, my gosh, they're, they're the best. Yeah. yeah. There, there's Growing up in England, my mum used to freeze them um, in uh, summer so we could have them at Christmas in winter. So I think of yeah, that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wish I did a bit more bottling, but things don't last long enough in our house, just all get gobbled up. Gobbled up. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Um, so I think that I think that covers everything I needed to uh, just <laughs> discuss. I was going to say drill you about, but no. <laughs> No, it's been great fun. I'm sorry about the funny angle with um, my phone. We ha I had to go to the phone rather than the computer because we had such a last minute drama with um, didn't we? We had a bit of a um, kerfuffle before we started. So sorry about this weird um, angle of um, yeah. the bit. Anyway, we we made we made it happen and loved it. Really enjoyed it. It's been Thank great. Um, yes. So um, I guess what you're looking forward to, that because that would be my finishing question, is finishing your fig painting or do you have other things for <laughs> winter yeah. coming up? <laughs> oh, I've, I've got an exhibition I'm working towards um, oh. in a restaurant in Auckland. Um, I've got another restaurant in um, Australia, which is exciting, in uh, Melbourne that I'm working towards uh, painting for them. So, yeah, lots lots of painting to do and, and get the fig painting um, sent off to... Um, uh, I was going to say Arrowtown down to Queenstown. Yeah, that's the that's the next painting that's going to be sent off. Yeah, but I, I'm most looking forward to seeing the painting in your neck of the woods in Sydney. This carrot painting, which yes. is going to um, be be sent off soon and be framed in Sydney and and in the restaurant. So that's um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that up. And hopefully one day I'll get over there and get to eat the dessert and see the painting at the same time. Yes, and I encourage everyone to um, definitely tune into your Instagram because, um, you know, you're so generous in uh, the bits and snippets that you share and just I just love hearing oh, you describe you. 
um, everything that you do. It's amazing, yeah. Plus, obviously. You're just seeing it all come together like that multi-sensory thing is just, just incredible. Oh, thank so, you so much. Thank you again for your time. It's been uh -huh. fantastic. And thanks, everyone, for joining um, us uh, today, this evening, tomorrow, or wherever you are um, yeah. in the time zones or world. Um, just wait there a second, Nicola, while I play our outro. And if everybody else, if you'd like to um, send any messages to uh, Nicola, please type that in the comments below. But, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, Vicky just mentioned synesthesia. Yes, we were both just talking about how yeah. we wish that we were synesthesia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even for the day. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, amazing. so amazing. Okay, yeah. well, thank you again. It's been so good. And um, Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone that's watched. Yes. And lovely questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, stay tuned. Thanks. Bye.